Hello class, today we're going to be covering lesson 14, the civil rights in the United States. Here we have a civil rights protest that was taking place in Seattle, Washington. I wanted to use this image just to reiterate the problem of discrimination and the fact that Jim Crow that had been upheld by the Plessy versus Ferguson decision in 1896 had not only created a problem with segregation in the American South, but a problem for equal rights all over the nation. After World War II, President Harry S. Truman desegregated the United States military. In July of 18, 1948, rather, Harry S. Truman signed Executive Order 9981, which stated, it is hereby declared to be the policy of the president that there shall be equality of treatment and opportunity for all persons in the armed services without regard to race, color, religion, or national origin. This policy was hotly debated and protested in the era, but after World War II and moving into the Korean War, the United States Armed Forces was no longer desegregated. And what we've talked about in previous lessons is that Minority units that served in World War I and World War II had served with distinction and received numerous individual and unit citations. Notably, uh, groups that we talked about during World War II were the Tuskegee Airmen, the African American Aviation Unit, the Nisai Regiment, the 442nd Infantry Unit that was made up of Japanese Americans, and numerous units that served, um, you know, numerous minority units that were of Mexican-American descent and Latino descent who served in all major um, branches of the United States military service. Furthermore, Native American tribes like the Navajo who served with the U.S. Marines as code talkers during World War II. The Supreme Court desegregates public schools. On May 17, 1954, the Supreme Court ruled on the landmark case Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas, unanimously agreeing that segregation in public schools was, un was unconstitutional. The ruling that was in favor of Linda Brown and her family paved the way for large-scale desegregation across the United States. The decision overturned the 1896 Supreme Court case, Plessy v. Ferguson, that sanctioned separate but equal segregation of the races, and obviously segregation and the separation of the races in public education. It was a victory for NAACP attorney Thurgood Marshall, Howard Law graduate, who graduated first in his class, um, one of the other uh, attorneys that was defense attorneys that was involved with this, uh, Spotswood Robinson. This would, uh, interestingly enough, uh, Thurgood Marshall would later return to the Supreme Court as the nation's first African American justice appointed by Lyndon B. Johnson in 1968. Here we have Thurgood Marshall in the center with the other members of the defense team the NAACP defense team on May 17, 1954, outside the Supreme Court. This is a woman and her child holding up the paper, High Court Banned Segregation in Public Schools on the Steps of the Supreme Court. The Dorothy Davis case here in Virginia, uh, very important and connected to the Brown case, by interpreting its powers broadly, the Supreme Court can and does reshape American society. The Supreme Court case Brown versus Board of Education also included the Virginia case Dorothy Davis versus County School Board of Prince Edward County. More than 100 students filed a lawsuit to seek repairs for the Robert Moton High School in Farmville, Virginia. It was a segregated school that is now a nationally historic landmark in Farmville. The case was appealed 
and attached to the landmark Brown versus Board of Education case. Richmond native Oliver Hill, classmate of Thurgood Marshall and graduate of Howard Law School as well, second in his class behind Marshall, led the NAACP legal defense team in the Virginia case. Here we have Dorothy Davis and the students at R.R. Moton High School. This is a famous image of the monument that is located at the Virginia State Capitol. It seemed like reaching for the moon, Barbara Johns and her quote about the students on strike from R.R. Moton High School. This is the other side of the monument. The legal system can force open doors and sometimes even knock down walls, but it cannot build bridges. That job belongs to you and me. Here we have Thurgood Marshall on the left and Oliver Hill on the right. And this is just a example of how Virginia and the southern uh, states responded to the Brown decision, among other states in the United States during this era. Massive resistance, schools closed, like, for example, schools in Prince Edward County closed for a five-year period. The establishment of private academies all over the American South, um, a lot of Christian academies that were established um, would prevent African Americans to attend the school. An example would be um, uh, Richmond Christian Academy. Um, white flight from urban school systems like Richmond City, um, Atlanta are two examples of white flight cities in the American South where counties are going to, out, surrounding counties outside of these city centers are going to develop white flight schools. And then protests, riots, lynchings, and violence. So here on the bottom left, we have students protesting the desegregation of schools. And on the bottom right, we have um, the uh, a, a pretty amazing image of US soldiers um, having to quell a major protest against desegregation. The murder of Emmett Till. In August of 1955, Emmett Till, a 14-year-old boy from Chicago, was visiting family in Mississippi. During his visit, he was kidnapped, brutally beaten, shot, and dumped in the Tallahatchie River for allegedly whistling at a white woman and making a comment to her. Two white men, Roy Bryant, the woman's husband, and J.W. Mill Millam, his half-brother, were arrested for the murder and later acquitted by an all-white jury. They later boasted about committing the murder in Look Magazine uh, in an interview with Look Magazine. The case was reopened, but Emmett Till's murders were never brought to justice. Here we have an uh, image of Emmett Till. I did not include the image of Emmett Till in the open casket. The NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, advanced the civil rights of African Americans by challenging segregation in the courts and leading mass nonviolent protests throughout the country. The NAACP helped reshape public opinion and secured the passage of important civil rights legislation. As we mentioned before, some of the leading members of the NAACP defense teams, Thurgood Marshall, Spotswood Robinson, Oliver Hill, um, a number of them were actually, all three of these gentlemen who served on the legal defense team were uh, graduates of Howard, um, the leading African-American law program during that era. Rosa Parks and the Montgomery Bus Boycott. On December 1st, 1955, NAACP member Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat at the front of the bus uh, to a white passenger defying a Southern custom of the time that, that required African Americans to sit in the back of public transportation like buses and trains and trolleys. 
So in this particular case, it was actually uh, organized. Uh, Rosa Parks was very highly educated. She um, had, you know, was one of the few African American women who had the um, right to vote and had a voter registration in the state of Alabama. Parks was arrested for refusing to move from the seat. In response to her arrest, the African American community in Montgomery, Alabama launched a bus boycott, which lasted for more than a year until the buses were desegregated on December 21st, 1956. As newly elected president of the Montgomery Improvement Association, the MIA, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was instrumental in leading the bus boycott and working alongside Rosa Parks. Here we have the iconic image of Rosa Parks' mugshot. The Southern Christian Leadership Conference. In 1957, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Charles K. Steele, and Fred, Fred uh, Shuttlesworth established the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, of which King was made the first president. The SCLC, as it became known, was a major force in organizing the civil rights movement and based its principles on nonviolent and civil disobedience. According to King, it is essential that the civil rights movement not sink to the level of the racists and hate mongers who oppose them. King declared, we must for forever conduct our struggle on the high plane of dignity and discipline. Here we have Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. standing outside the headquarters of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. The Little Rock Nine. At the start of the school year of 1957, Little Rock, Arkansas was the center stage for massive resistance in the United States to the Linda Brown decision that we previously discussed. Formerly all-white Central High School learned that the school would be integrated in September of 1957, three years after the Brown decision. Nine black students were blocked from entering the school by the Arkansas National Guard by order of Arkansas Governor Orville Faubus. The event made national news. President Dwight D. Eisenhower was forced to send in federal troops, the 101st Airborne, who had served with distinction during World War II, to intervene on behalf of the students, who became known as the Little Rock Nine. Students were escorted by soldiers from class to class for the entire school year. Here we have the students that were the Little Rock Nine with their uh, NAACP sponsor and host. The Greensboro sit-in. On February 1st, 1960, four black students from North Carolina A&T Agriculture and Technical College began a sit-in at a segregated Woolworths lunch counter. This is uh, basically a, a place to eat inside the Woolworths in Greensboro, North Carolina. Although they were refused service, they were allowed to stay at the counter. The event triggered many similar nonviolent protests throughout the South. Six months later, the original four protesters were served lunch at the same Woolworths counter. Student sit-ins would be effective throughout the Deep South in integrating parks, parks, swimming pools, theaters, libraries, and other public facilities. It's a very famous uh, sit-in in Richmond, Virginia, known as Tallheimer's sit-in. This is an image of the, <coughs> excuse me, the Greensboro sit-ins. The Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the, uh, the SNCC, better known as SNCC, was founded at Shaw University in Raleigh, North Carolina by civil rights leader Ella Baker. The organization provided young African Americans with a place in the civil rights movement. SNCC later grew into a more radical organization, especially under the leadership of Stokely Carmichael, who served as the fourth chairman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in 1966 and 1967. This is a uh, famous button from SNCC, which is a white and black hand shaking um, as a means of unity. A lot of white students were involved in the 
in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee as well. 1961 Freedom Riders. Over the spring and summer of 1961, student volunteers began taking bus trips through the South to test out new laws that prohibited segregation in interstate travel facilities, which included buses and rail railway stations. Several of the groups of Freedom Riders, as they were, were called, were attacked by angry mobs along the way. The program, sponsored by the Congress of Racial Equality, Corps, and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, involved more than a thousand volunteers and mostly young uh, African American and white students. And this is the uh, famous Freedom Ride that started in D.C., went from D.C. to Richmond, to Farmville, to Greensboro, and then we start to see more violence as we go down and farther south. Uh, Rock Hill, South Carolina, the first scenes of violence um, as we move from Georgia to Alabama. The bus was <coughs> attacked with a bomb from Alabama to Mississippi. The students were ultimately arrested and they did not make it to their final destination of New Orleans. This is the bus bombing that took place in Anniston, where the buses were firebombed on May 14th. Civil rights strides in 1962 and 1963. In 1962, James Meredith became the first African-American student to enroll at the University of Mississippi. Violence and riots surrounding the incident caused President John F. Kennedy to send 5,000 federal troops in order to provide protection for James Meredith. In April of 1963, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was arrested and jailed during an anti-segregation protest in Birmingham, Alabama. He famously wrote a letter from Birmingham jail arguing that individuals have a moral duty to dis disobey unjust laws, similar to Thoreau's on civil disobedience. In May of 1963, during civil rights protests in Birmingham, Commissioner of Public Safety Eugene Bull Connor used fire hoses and police dogs on uh, African American demonstrators. The images were publicized all over the national news and it started to gain more national awareness of the civil rights issues and <coughs> the violence that was being inflicted on nonviolent protesters mostly African-American, but also white. On June 12, 1963, NAACP Field Secretary Medgar Evers was murdered in his driveway in Jackson, Mississippi. The, his assassin or killer was Byron De La Beckwith, uh, who was acquitted twice, and it took 30 years to convict Beck, uh, De La Beckwith for the murder of Medgar Evers. There we have James Meredith's graduation from Ole Miss in 1963. The 1963 March on Washington, August 28th, 1963, about 200,000 people joined the March on Washington. Congregating at the Lincoln Memorial, people listened to representatives from the, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and the Congress of Racial Equality. Individuals gave speeches about a plan for civil rights legislation in the United States Congress. Um, the guy that organized this nonviolent protest was the same individual that organized the Double V campaign during World War II, A. Philip Randolph. The 1963 March on Washington had an important effect on public opinion about civil rights in the United States. Participants were inspired by the I Have a Dream speech given by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The march helped influence public opinion to support civil rights legislation, and the march also demonstrated the power of nonviolent mass protest. Here we have the bird's eye view above the Lincoln Memorial of the National Mall on August 28, 1963, the March on Washington. And here we have Dr. King
with his image here the at the uh, March on Washington. And then this is Dr. King's I Had a Dream speech. All right. Well, this is where we're going to pump the brakes for today. Please let me know if you've got any questions. Thanks so much.